British Airways is one of the UK's most visible brands. It sells Britishness as a mark of quality. Some passengers are happy to part with small fortunes to fly in its first class. A one-way fare is just over $10,000. But in the last decade, the business has faced financial crisis. Today, more people fly EasyJet than BA. We all fly to the same destinations, so what can we do to stand out? As the airline reaches a turning point, our cameras have been allowed unique access to its inner world. From the top level decisions. We're not as big in China as we should be, so getting this right is very important. To the daily challenges of its global operation. Actually, sir, <clears throat> it's not all right because the flight's closed for check-in. We've been following some of the airline's 40,000 staff. Do you know what the pressure is on? As they work to meet exacting standards. Very disappointed. In this episode, we'll reveal how it manages the challenges of operating out of the world's most congested airport. All, all the delays cost the company money. Trains a new generation of pilots. Rotate, engine fire. To fall at the last hurdle would be a, a nightmare and it would be sort of career over. And tries to stay afloat in a competitive market. Beneficial if you can, ride a knock every now and again. 552 runs back on stand to offload a passenger who's having a panic attack. Panic attack. Panic attack. There are an awful lot of things within aviation that can influence, and the vast majority of them uh, are not necessarily controlled by us. Today, something special is happening at Crane Bank, the airline's flight training centre. For the first time in over a decade, the company's training new cadet pilots. The first since 9-11, when the airline industry went into decline. 50, 30, 20, retard. Their 18-month course costs each cadet £84,000. Most pay for it with a loan guaranteed by the airline. Failure would be expensive. Had it again? Uh, yeah, well, it was really, really good fun. Um, pretty much what I expected. Uh, a lot of work and very intensive, but really good fun. The urge to fly is so strong, some recruits have moved into an airport hotel for the final weeks of training. They call it the bug. I was 27 before I, before I flew in a light aircraft controlling it myself, and as soon as I left the ground, it just I, I knew that I, I had to learn to fly. It's so incredibly addictive. 30-year-old Joel Garabedian has gambled a lot on becoming a BA pilot. You know, I had a, a job which I enjoyed, I had a house, a car, all, you know, I, my life was complete, but the, the lure of flying was just incredibly strong. 24-year-old Andy McClellan's father was a pilot. For Andy, flying is all about taking control. As soon as we put those thrust levers forward and you feel the power coming from the engine, you get a certain amount of excitement, uh, and then you take off and it's you. And it's freedom because essentially what people say on the ground and what you do, you're, you're in charge of your own destiny. This is just all I've ever wanted to do. To fall at the last hurdle would be a, a nightmare and it would be sort of career over and I'd have to reevaluate and think of different career paths that I'd have to go down. I'm kind of financially all in on, on the scheme, but from an emotional point of view, I've, um, I've invested the last two years of my life in the scheme, I've been away from my wife and my friends, and uh, obviously it would be it would be beyond disappointing to, to sort of have to have to give up on that dream. There were four and a half thousand applicants for the first intake of new pilots. Only eighty nine got through. In these critical last few weeks, the cadets need to show they've got what it takes to fly passenger planes. 
What are you expecting? A lot of work. A lot of work, that's <laughs> what I like. <laughs> what kind of work? Is it book work, knowledge? A combination, really, book work, knowledge, and also other things that we haven't really done before, because, of course, we've been flying with sort of nobody in the back, and now all of a sudden we've got passengers and all the problems that, that deals with. So that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the problems that problem. passengers give you. <laughs> On any given day, 110,000 passengers travel with BA. The company's hub is at Heathrow, the busiest international airport in the world. Here, 84 airlines compete fiercely for passengers and space. Getting people onto the airline's 800 daily flights and sending them off on time is an operation of great complexity. A workforce of 40,000 pull together around the clock, battling against whatever's thrown at them. Morning. Morning, how you doing? It's gonna get busy, it's the calm before the snow. Yeah, it's gonna get busy. Rugby player, Kevin McKenzie is one of the airline's operations control managers. <laughs> it's, a it's a feeling I've always had running onto a rugby pitch. You get that little knot in the bottom of your stomach because you not, never quite know what to expect. For the next 12 hours, he's the man in charge. Morning all. Kevin's part of a team of 90, responsible for all BA planes around the world. Morning, guys. <laughs> We're here for dealing with the unplanned. That's effectively normal business for us. My responsibility is to oversee the whole of the network globally and to maintain the operational plan um, as published. So when external factors influence that plan, the teams in here work to recover that and get the operation back on track. That's going to, that's going to infuriate me. From this control room, all parts of the airline's network are tracked. Not unusual to be loved. Oh, that's probably not a bad thing. I was just singing. Anushka Warwick is a turnaround manager. It's her job to keep flights running to time. Any delay can have a knock-on effect for the rest of the day's schedule. Uh, where are we going? We are going to stand 543 to meet the 216 arrival, which has uh, been declared a medical emergency, which means that um, a passenger on board is feeling unwell. Can I just confirm it's the passenger in 5 Alpha? Bang to the head of the day before you flew and now not feeling well, is that right? Do I have any paramedics up there? Press the hash key. Care control. Now attending. Care control. Morning, care Hi, At the start of every shift, Kevin has a conference call with all the airline's operational departments. Anybody else on the call, please? It's a chance to flag up any potential disruption. Uh, no, That's right. OK, the medic has arrived, apparently. Ah, here we go. Morning, morning. Excuse me. <laughs> Just going to stay out of the way at the moment, because there's a lot of paramedics in there, but they're going to be taking the gentleman out and onto the high lift. He's got everything, sh shoes and... Thank you. Right, that's it, you're done. Ops update overnight, please. OK, morning, Kev, morning, all. The 216 this morning arrived early. He declared a medical emergency on arrival, and obviously that's being dealt by Heathrow and the medical teams. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Take that. Morning, Clive. Uh, aircraft standbys and risks for the day, please. Lima, Lima, uh, lightning strike to repair, so it's going into the hangar this morning. 
One of the variables Kevin has to contend with is the constant servicing of the fleet, which takes aircraft out of operation. The more grounded planes there are, the harder his day will be. Okay, good, thank you, security. Uh, Mali and the Maldives, there's protests possible there, so there's a crew advisory in place for crews to avoid demonstrations where possible. Political unrest can strand crews and their planes. And Rio, part of the Brazilians have deployed a thousand troops around about half a kilometer away from the crew hotel, so the crews have been moved away to Copacabana Beach for the time being. It's a tough job, someone's going to do it. Um, passenger group, Tony, any issues, please? 46,000 departing today throughout the day. A lot of busy flights this morning, so Shawmall's very busy. It's the school holidays. Passenger numbers are up, and so's the pressure. OK, so what impact, if we don't get those, if we don't get cover on those two areas, what's going to be the impact, please? It was normally around the lunchtime period where they struggle when we start getting into long haul flights with heavy wheelchair loads. OK, good, thank you very much. Well, not good, but you know what I mean. Right, we've got quite a few storms around at the moment. We've got um, Hurricane Raymond, which is currently to the west of Acapulco. Its uh, strongest gust will be tomorrow around about midday of 130 knots. Kevin must keep track of whatever the weather throws at him so his schedule doesn't get blown off course. And finally, a couple of volcanoes we're watching. We're looking at uh, one on the Kamchatka Peninsula. The danger is, is if there's a, a, a significant eruption there, it pushes that ash down into North America. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. Shout out if anything changes. Cheers. We start the day with spare resources in all areas. So we start with spare aircraft, we start with uh, spare flight and cabin crew. That gives us the flexibility we need to tweak the program as and when we need. In the daily rush to win customers, the airline has a lot staked on its service. And it's particularly British style. Miami, lovely. Come over and we'll, we'll get you all checked in. OK. Ex Harrods manager David Page has spent 18 years honing his check in manner. Today is the start of the half term. All the flights are very busy and so it's going to be very interesting. About 45,000 passengers travelling through. It's um, going to be a Quite a lot of pressure today, I would say. So, where are you travelling to? Madrid. Madrid, what time? Uh, 9.10. 9.10, 5.12, uh, OK. Actually, sir, <clears throat> it's not all right because the flight's closed for check-in, so they're not going to be able to check you in now. But I can't check you in for this one because it closed a while ago now. Some people get very, very upset and they're very stressed and they're going away on business. They might be going to a funeral or might be going to a friend's wedding. And of course, you know, time is, is the element. Right, we need to be very, very quick. OK, chaps, we're going to drop your bags off quickly and then you need yeah. to go straight through to the gate. So Thank just you. follow me with the bags and we'll send them down. Is no, take the back home. A bit tight. We're going to have to run. If they'd stayed in the queue, there's a possibility they could have missed their flight. That was, that was that, in the right place at the right time to recover that. If you've got any baby milk, it's in, it's in the bottles already made up, or is it powdered? Powder. Right, OK, that's absolutely fine. If it wasn't, they might ask you just to taste okay. it. Hello. OK, do you want to just come over? Would you like kids? There's always the famous line, I couldn't eat a whole one, isn't there? Um, I do like children, yeah, of course everybody does. I thought you can stretch out and have a little sleep. So you sat there before? Yeah. Now, okay, Kevin, I'll say goodbye to Mum and we'll get you through, yeah? During the holidays, the airline looks after thousands of children travelling on their own. They're known as sky flyers. <clears throat> There you go, you're ready. OK, when we get through, you can wave to your mum, yeah? Before we go through. All right, have a good flight. 
points. Is that called Chanel? Chanel, Chanel. Chanel, yeah. Chanel. You like Chanel, yeah? Expensive. For an extra charge, trained chaperones known as aunties and uncles will escort children to the plane to meet the cabin crew. Someone will meet you, someone like me will meet you in Nice, okay? <laughs> all right, hi there. All right there. So, Lewis, have I said okay, that right? Lewis. 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 <laughs> the airline becomes a sort of boarding school in the sky. Five year old Sienna is one of the airline's youngest solo flyers. She lives in France with her mum and travels on her own between London and Paris once a month. What's her name? Sienna. Sienna. Oh, I love that name, Sienna. Sienna, how are you today? How are you? Good. You're good. Let me see your nail varnish. Oh, that's yeah, nice. Mummy's not going to be happy with is that. Is she not? No. <laughs> Thank you. Sienna, this is Carolyn. Is she going to take you? Strong, See you, darling. You'll be fine. Can you come in with me? Come on, I'm going to come with you as well, sweetheart. Oh, okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Right, okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, you have to say bye here. Sienna? You'll be fine, sweetheart. They'll treat you like a special little princess on board. Yeah. OK. How long is she going Same for? Time. She lives there. Oh. She's going back home. Oh. It's always so hard. But um, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. She does love it. She does love the service. And they do treat them like a little princess. So, yeah, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. Hopefully it won't be too long now. You'll be back with Mummy and she can have all the presents that you have for her. I've been single dad for, uh, for a week, um, which is, uh, you know, lots of matching clothes with dresses and lots of pink and stuff. I think I'm going to the pub, to be fair. I think I deserve a pint. <laughs> Services like Skyflyers are part of an attempt to differentiate themselves from no-frills carriers like Ryanair and EasyJet who dispensed with such extras, focused on cheap ticket prices and soared ahead in overall passenger numbers. Madam, where are you travelling to? Where are you travelling to? To Russia. To Russia. Where's your baggage, your suitcase? You're, you're just you checking in this... OK, I'll just put a note you're bringing the buggy with you to the gate. Oh, you got him well trained. Uh, British Railways, uh, one time I completely lost uh, <laughs> uh, my bag, and uh, after six months I received a refund, par partial refund. So we try not to check out baggage. <laughs> Four floors below is the airport's baggage system. Calm today, it was chaos here when the terminal opened in 2008. Thousands of bags were separated from their owners. The day was branded a national embarrassment. Today, far fewer passengers leave without their luggage. With 11 miles of conveyor belts, Terminal 5's baggage system is one of the largest in the world. We got 421 bags estimated. I'm hoping we don't have a cruise. They don't normally take one bag with them, because obviously they have their gowns and their suits for their captain's table dinner. No, Rambo's come out again. Everyone dreads Lagos. No, everyone dreads Lagos. But other than that, no, everyone dreads Lagos. It's just a heavier bag. If it's heavier than 32, you usually get someone to come and help you lift it. 
20-year-old baggage apprentice, Niall Barry, is one of 225 handlers on shift today. Rusty, my nickname is, because everyone calls me Nail, so Rusty Nail. That's what it is, yeah. Everyone's got nicknames. They always say, you know you made it in BA because you've got a nickname. Look, look, look at these two, look. Old Bodget and Scarpa. 18 years I've worked with these two. Golf lover Greg Breslin is one of over 50 crew leaders. Each crew is responsible for loading up to five flights a shift. Never since, like, 9-11, the bags get screamed more, they have high security levels. They'll go downstairs where they'll get x-rayed and then they'll go up into the, uh, the conveyors that are switching around above our heads here. As and when they get to our four belts, They'll go down the correct ones. The system is pretty much all automated now, so there's not a lot of human contact with the bags. Everything's so much more secure these days. Let's go, Mr Sweeney. Right, so we're off to stand 544. You don't want any problems, you want everything to go sweetly, but... Mr Sweeney's a bit of a Jonah, so... Uh, we're missing a few people, so uh, one of the people is having their bag searched. Uh, the security have identified something in the bag that they want to just check out. I'll have to go, really sorry. <laughs> What's happening with this one at the door? Apparently there's a firearm inside this bag, so the police are going to come to make sure it's, it's legal to be uh, transported. All firearms have to go through additional security, and uh, you have to have special licences. And they're just, so obviously that's travelling with this passenger, and it, it'll just, the police will come and it'll come down, I'll just stick it in the bin right at the end. So we've got 15 minutes, so in theory I'm supposed to wrap up in five. The passengers have to be traced, so they can open the case in the presence of a police officer. OK, what's the, the passenger's name again, sorry? 37 Juliet. 37 Juliet. Away from So what's the problem? This fire alarm. So what are you going to do, open the bag now? They haven't called Jack, no? That's right, yeah. What is it? What do you see inside it? Oh, no, it's the suspected firearm is just part of a child's Halloween costume. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. Kieran, you stay with the gun. The fancy dress accessory has held the flight up for a quarter of an hour. Finally, the toy gun is back in the suitcase. You, you, can't, you can't take a chance on things like that. Safety is our prime thing. That's my role here, is to make sure that that aircraft is safe and secure above anything else. Our customers believe that our professional standards will deliver them to their destination in comfort and safety. 17 months into their training, these cadet pilots are being reminded of the stakes. Maybe you have just been downright lucky. But maybe, one day when you least expect it, your luck will run out. Most people believe the unthinkable will never happen to them. If we are to avoid tragedy striking us again, you have to go looking for trouble. It's normal for us to be introduced to things like air disasters because it's good to put it into perspective. I think the danger is people get complacent about flying because you see so many aircraft taking off every day, you see so many people going on holiday, 
and for people it's become almost an, a normal way of life and you forget that if you have these tiny slip-ups that these major disasters can occur. Okay, speedbird, speedbird. Nine five, nine five. In 2008, both engines on flight BA38 from Beijing stopped because of a fuel problem on its approach to Heathrow. The lives of 152 passengers and crew were in the hands of its pilot. He got the plane down just inside the airport's perimeter without a single fatality, an extraordinary display of skill. Most pilots will never experience such major engine problems, at least not for real. So what's the plan today, Andy? Uh, we're doing FATOs, so engine failures have to take off, uh, and other emergencies, so basically learning how to fly it with only one engine. Auto thrust blue, thrust set. Each cadet pilot has to deal with engine problems in a simulator before they'll be allowed to fly passengers for real. Rotate, engine fire. Positive climb. Yeah. Up. Being told engine one on five, it's actually a trigger for going through our drills. OK, we've got an engine one fire. OK, I'm trying to do that. How's that feel, trim wise? Yeah, fine. Rather than being sort of nervous and scared about it, it just hits you and you go like, right, I need to do this, 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 and then we're, we'll all be safe. Snatched it a bit too fast on the rotation rate, so yeah. it pitched up, and then I released it too quickly, so it dropped quite a lot. And do you know what? It's good that you witnessed that. At British Airways, we train or test the engine failure flying every six months, and that ensures that the guys have got top-class skills and that they're able to competently and confidently handle an engine failure. OK, so just let me know when you settle down and we'll fly it down to uh, minimums. OK, I think I'm ready. Excellent. You have control. I have control. Is it a common occurrence? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and this is the reason that we have to train it so often, is because it requires precise handling, yeah. but it doesn't happen very often. Minimum. Go around. Go around flat. Go around flat. The only way that we can keep the skills up is by training it in the simulator every six months. Don't sink. Don't sink. 15 years I've flown, I've not had an engine failure. Touch wood. <laughs> and do you want one now? No. <laughs> V1. Continue engine fire. Rotate. Positive climb. Here up. How's that feel, Tim Wise? Yeah, great. Lovely rudder control on the sense line there, and the absolute. Perfect, it's really nice and done. So, um, if I could have the gear down, please. Fast levers, right, can't break on. OK, absolutely great with the rudder control, absolutely immaculate, runway sense line. Every simulator session is four gruelling hours. Cadets have 12 of these in total. We didn't quite get everything we want to get done in, but I'm sure we can pick it up in the next couple of details. When you come out, you are absolutely exhausted, and it's it's really, really tiring. Your mind itself just feels really tired on the amount of new information and the amount of practice and concentration that you've had to put in on this four-hour session. Approaches, um, to see how we're doing for time, but, um... If Andy passes and makes it to his first flight, his starting salary will be just over £30,000. In time, that could rise to over a hundred thousand. Not demanded. All right, cool. These are all standby as well. Baggage is good money, but the pilots is good money. Yeah, so that's about it. But no, the pilots. You get pilots that come down here. They say hello. They talk to everyone. No, I, I wouldn't say they're posh. No, you get good and bad in everyone. 
there's, there's probably baggage handlers who'd think, oh my God, he, he, do you know what I mean? People would probably think baggage handlers are all common. Pilot, you'll see, uh, there probably is a few posh ones. Then I just think, do you know what, when you've, when you've worked as hard as they have, and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and, 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 and you've got that much responsibility on a flight, you can be who you want to be. Competition for lucrative long-haul passengers is fierce. So the airline has to use every possible advantage to encourage people to fly with them instead of rival carriers. One such advantage is the ability to coordinate connecting flights in and out of its hub at Heathrow. Effectively, for operational decisions, we are still using the FICO weather. Flying passengers in from around Europe and feeding them onto long-haul departures and transferring intercontinental arrivals out onto its shorter European flights. On the 143 today, there are 49 passengers inbound off the 098. Right. Are you able, please, to have a look to see where in the system they are? With a third of all its passengers making these transfers, it desperately needs the connections to work. Get it wrong, and long-haul passengers could be tempted to fly with other airlines through different countries. It's another challenge for Kevin. By my calculations, they've got below minimum connection time. At the gate, Tony Friend is boarding some of the late passengers. She's hoping all will make it. Look at your passport, your sir. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy your trip. Thank you for choosing British Airways. Twelve to come. Are we going to get them? Oh, I don't know. She just put the last call now. F12, the yellow key. Yes, you just out. enter that. Well, one never knows really, but you always get a few passengers who are held up with security or they're connecting to this flight and they've got caught up in connections or flights come in late from another terminal. So it can happen. Hello, sir. Thank you. And if you just go round, sir, that's good. With just 12 minutes till pushback, Tony is on the hunt for four missing passengers. Are you going to Miami? No. Yes. Okay, no. thank you. Perhaps next year. <laughs> Are you going to Miami? No. No? Okay, thank you. No. Not looking good, is it? The nightmare of all nightmares is if we start getting red bags, which is when a passenger basically just doesn't turn up for his flight. And it happens a lot. Uh, we got a red bag. Happy days. We got loads of red bags. We got loads of red bags. Poor red bags. I think it is red for danger. Oh. It doesn't mean oh. it is red. Now the bags are off. The passengers won't be flying. All I know is I'll take the bags off. I don't do with passengers, thankfully. That's the dispatcher's call. <laughs> Why, thankfully? hard enough as it is, let alone dealing with passengers. All our passengers are absolutely wonderful and nobody misses a flight intentionally and we so certainly don't want them to miss. We've got to get them on their way. Uh, are you going to Miami? Uh -huh. I'm very, very sorry. I'm really sorry. Sir, I'm really, really sorry that you've missed the flight. Yeah, but it's not my, my... I, I know, I know, I know. I'm so sorry, especially having you. You don't want to miss your flight, it's a long day anyway. The four missing passengers have arrived, but their flight has left. No, pero sale otro vuelo dentro de tres horas. No, hemos tenido contratiempos, así que nos dejaron avión y siempre viajamos para París, para distintos países, Londres, Grecia, y nunca nos había dejado el, el avión. Primera vez que nos pasa esto y es porque salió retardado a Grecia y de paso la seguridad que no nos 
nos detuvo una maleta y tuvimos que parar como seis pasajeros porque no nos dieron prioridad. We had 300 odd people on that flight. And you know, how long do you hold it waiting for people when you don't know how far or how long they're going to be? They might be shopping. They could be anywhere. Hello, it's Ellie. Hello. We got a um, 15 minute delay on the Miami. I mean, it's a shame, but all, all the delays cost the company money. So we have, to, we have to be as quick as we can to get the aircraft flying. A delay of just 15 minutes can knock on through the schedule and cost tens of thousands of pounds. We've got four seats for you. So uh, we're going today. Yes, we're going today. Uh, vamos, let's. Okay, okay. Todos. Can I help? No, I can't. Yes. Let's go for a lie down. Oh. Don't stall. Seat belt, Mr. Sweeney. It's the longest Miami in history, isn't it? Back in the terminal, David is on the lookout for people to help. I'm fortunate enough to be one of the few staff that's got three golden tickets, um, which is what gold card holders give to us when you've achieved really high standards of service. Sir, are you OK? Are you all checked in? Gold cards are held by the airline's most frequent flyers. Only they have the special privilege of awarding staff a golden ticket. No, no, we, we, can, we can get you all checked in. Where are you travelling to? Hong Kong. Mr Chadra, so these are your three baggage receipts, Perfect. so keep those nice and safe. Yep. And would you happen to have my frequent flyer number in there? Uh, I'll just check for you. But there is a lounge in that concourse. There is, over at B, yeah. yes. There you go. It's 15 Thank you. pounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A golden ticket is the airline's equivalent to a gold star on a school report. There was a little old lady. Sounds like the cliche, doesn't it? The little old lady going to see her daughter somewhere in Europe. I can't remember now. Um, and she was very upset. She'd recently lost her husband. I took her through to the lounge sat in there with her, had a cup of tea for about an hour, calmed her down, went back and collected her uh, to take her to her gate like, a couple of hours later. And again, it was a gold card holder sitting in the lounge that had recognised that and came and said, I want you to have this, you've looked after the old lady and well done. I'm always on the prowl, um, but it's not about that. It's, it, I just feel that it makes you, you know, when they give them to you, it makes you proud that you know you've done a good job. And it's not about getting the next golden ticket. It's just about being consistent across the board, looking after the passengers. OK. okay. Oh, do put that on there, John. Thank you. And that very heavy bag. I feel safe Portrait service, service, isn't it? Right, this. OK. Yeah. If they were giving out knighthoods, of customer service, I'd like to think I was at the front of the queue for that. Yes, yeah, I'd put those away safe because you're not going to need those till you get oh, to the right. gate. All right. Many Take care. Thank you. Bye bye, Mr. Bushby. Why are you somebody who is special? Yeah. I don't know. Probably if they could clone me and have a thousand of me, they'd be very, very happy. But uh, I don't know. I, it's just something within me that I've got of, of delivering what they want. David may meet and greet passengers, but someone else has to pick up after them. The airline's unseen workforce of contract cleaners are known as aircraft groomers. Mr. Williams, milk try over there. Yeah, and this milk try. Yeah. Please, thank you. Today's lead aircraft groomer is Christina Mate, a Romanian handball player and trained accountant. She's in charge of a team of 11 who have a target of just 75 minutes to clean this aircraft. It's coming from India, it's very, very dirty. It's taken more than one hour and a half because all over it's uh, uh, messy, wood on the floor, on the galley, everywhere. If it's coming from America, it's okay. 
we can finish even in uh, one hour and 20 minutes. I think people will be shocked at some of the states that uh, the aircraft arrived in. Uh, certain things which I cannot mention. We actually find actually one aircraft I was called out by my crew uh, because there was actually, I'm going to say it, faeces actually in the club seat on the floor and the area had just been taped off. So I actually came and cleared it up. <coughs> Have you done your lockers yet? Former restaurant owner Paul Boswell has come on board to check the standard of cleaning. He oversees the cleaning of up to 95 long haul flights each day. Has that been reported? We told Christina, broken meal tray. The behaviour of people, I think once they get on board, maybe they're in that holiday mode, some people, and it's like, OK, I can do what I want, I'm relaxing. But really, you know, they throw food on the floor, drinks are spilled, take no ownership at all. But at the end of the day, that's our job, we clear it up. But I'm going to go to first class, because obviously, prime passengers as well as club, they're all prime, but because they pay that extra bit as well, it has to be tip top. Home. Yes, immaculate. One of, them, one of my specialities, I'm afraid. People say my house is like a show house, even though it's old. <laughs> you done? No, Everything? we're going with blankets no. and the olive's gone. With the plane cleaned, time for last minute cabin checks. Sometimes you could get a window blind stuck, and when you try and free it, it breaks, so we have to replace it. Engineer Sajid Hussain is looking for any obvious defects. Sometimes the toilets are not flushing, they are blocked up, so we make sure that they work OK as well, like, you know, to the last minute. Problems caused by the strange things found in aircraft toilets make their way back to the control room for lead engineer Steve Duffy to deal with. Well, we've got in the order of between 2,100 and 2,200 toilets across all our aircraft. And on an average day, we will have between four and 10 unserviceable across all of those aircraft. In most cases that we uh, have toilet problems, there's actually something in the toilet that shouldn't be in the toilet. Whether it be a towel, a book, Gucci wallet is the funniest thing I've seen down there. It all adds to the overflow of problems Kevin has to face on a daily basis. Beneficial if you can ride a knock every now and again. Um, there will be days when you will feel that there's an awful lot being thrown at you. As there are an awful lot of things within aviation that can influence, and the vast majority of them uh, are not necessarily controlled by us. So there is a front that's going to come through tomorrow that's going to probably drop a load of weather on us, rain and stuff like that. As well as passengers, the airline flies hundreds of thousands of tonnes of cargo every year. Most is carried in the bellies of its passenger flights the rest in dedicated freight planes. Scheduling them falls to Kevin's team. Today they've been asked to fit in a special flight. Welcome everybody and thank you very, very much uh, our colleagues from Oxfam and Save the Children for coming to the meeting. It's incredibly challenging getting stuff to where it needs to be <laughs> yeah. as you can, yeah. you know as well as we do and you know this is really vital to get this stuff out mm. so certainly thank you from, from us. I, I just want to talk about the operations team are meeting with charities Oxfam and Save the Children to discuss a problem 7,000 miles away. This is just the beginning of a relief operation that has no clear end in sight. Virginia Vaidyanathan, BBC News, in the Philippines. The airline has already chartered four planes to the relief operation in the Philippines. They're providing this one for free. But there's a problem. The company wants to fly the cargo to Manila. But Oxfam and Save the Children want to fly it to Cebu. 500 miles closer to the heart of the disaster. Um, the problem we have with Cebu, which is, is uh, the airport itself, we can, we can get down at the airport, we can land on the runway and we can taxi. Um, the latest estimates, we will be waiting for around 15 hours to have cargo offloaded. Um, 
that's something that, that we really would struggle with. The nearest airport at Cebu is overwhelmed in the wake of the storm. The operations team are concerned the aircraft may get stuck there. Difficulty will be the cargo, if it goes to Manila, may end up having arrived in the Philippines, but then it may end up being stuck. And while the goods may all flow quicker in Manila to actually physically get them to the end beneficiaries, I think we're going to be, you know, we're in a lot better position, a stronger position if it does go to Cebu. In a nutshell, it's about the provision of water, the provision of sanitation, i.e. toilets, communications equipment. Oh, and also we're providing uh, what are called pee poo bags, um, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It's <laughs> a bag that you pee and poo into, except that it has a, a chemical in it which uh, will very quickly turn it into utilisable compost. I was told we had, uh, we had reserves. It's another challenge for operations. So we leave it an open time till yeah. 1500, and then if not, we have a plan B. Yeah. By the nature of the events which, which we are trying to support, they're often to parts of the world that we don't necessarily routinely fly. So some of our, our, our flight planning teams will have to work um, exceptionally hard to find routes that we can fly safely into these areas and get these guys uh, to, to where they need to go, but also back again with as little disruption to the remaining schedule as possible. Oxfam will take any help, whichever airport is agreed. The type of planes which BA has provided for us, uh, the cost per hour of an asset like that is extremely high, so I can see 15 hours for a plane to be sitting there doing nothing for a professional mover of freight like British Airways is, uh, well, it's a nightmare for them. We're not compelled. Um, uh, or to support these uh, organisations. It's something we choose to do because we see uh, the benefit um, that we can bring, the facilities and the resources and the people that we have who work for BA that can help and support um, often situations that uh, other organisations can't. After almost two years, Andy and Joel have finished their course and passed. Today, they'll get their wings. Andy, pleased nice to meet you. Good it's almost two years to get to this point, and uh, obviously it's just the sort of the end of the beginning, really. There we go. How's that? It is one of the proudest and happiest days of my life. It's almost a badge of honour to show what we've come through and to show that we are a proficient BA pilot. Andy and Joel are now first officers. Today, they'll both fly Airbus A320s for the first time, with up to 162 passengers on board. It's the day before Christmas today. Um, but I mean, it's, the anticipation is, is much greater than any, than any Christmas I've ever, ever had before, to be honest. Uh, obviously, we've got full pilot's uniform. I'm first officer, which means I get two stripes on my sleeve. At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just a uniform, and uh, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm incredibly proud to wear it, but uh, it's just a normal person underneath. <laughs> it makes no difference to who I actually am. Hello. Before flying, they'll both be thoroughly briefed on the route by two senior pilots. How are you doing? Hi, thanks. How are you? James. Uh, Andy. So, how are you feeling? Good. Nervous, but yeah. excited. Good. OK. What I propose to do is perhaps get you to be handling sector on the initial sector out to Geneva. Uh, strongly supported by both myself and Asa. Does that sound like a plan? That sounds great. Excellent. OK. Terrific. Day at school, yeah, quite a lot like that. <laughs> yes, I, I, butterflies is a, is, a, is a good word. It's a kind of a, a nice kind of nervousness. And it, I think it's more not knowing exactly how it will be than being nervous. I can't do the job, if you see what I mean. Pretty much like the simulator. Yeah, yeah exactly. A bit more time pressure and a bit more going on outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and your, your first customers are about to get on the aeroplane. 
Yeah, that's quite exciting. That's quite exciting, isn't it? That's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Happy about how to get your seat in the right place. Why don't you have a... Yeah, that's actually the yeah. perfect amount of light, actually, isn't it? If you're going to fly the departure, so what would you like to look at for your departure, um, ground out wise I suppose it depends on how it really. Yep. So, uh, uh, Andy's fully qualified in the aircraft, so he'll be doing the takeoff and landing today. I won't mention it to the customers, it's simply because um, Andy is fully qualified to be flying this aeroplane, but just in case there's anybody nervous around, he probably wouldn't want to say that it's their very first day flying uh, with passengers on board. Okay, yep, going? All right. Yep. Okay, sounds great. Great. So, gentlemen, we're going to start to get quite busy now, so uh, we'll say thank you very much, yep. and, and we'll leave it there. Thank you. Hello. Ably assisted here on the flight deck today by First Officer Joel Garabedian. We'll do our very best to get you all underway to Geneva just as swiftly and of course as safely as possible. Thank you. This is your First Officer Andrew McLeod speaking. Just a quick update from the flight deck. Uh, as you may have noticed we've started our initial descent down to 31,000 feet. At the minute, we're just crossing over the Alps. Uh, there should be some good views out both the left and the right-hand side. Uh, with Monte Bianco, or Mont Blanc, is currently sitting out to our left. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your flight, and we'll speak to you again once we get on the ground in Pisa. Thanks very much. While Andy and Joel got away on time, back in operations and other flights, not so lucky. Sorry, Kev, the 552 rose back on stand to offload a passenger who's having a panic attack. Panic attack. Panic attack. OK, good. Thank you very much. It's not abnormal. Um, it does happen quite often. Um, it'll happen because um, passengers, uh, when they actually get to the reality of sat at the end of the runway and the engines start powering up and, and you know, they think they're going to be OK, but they then um, uh, realise they won't. Apparently, she's been sitting in the terminal for about five hours. Uh, and then once she got on board, she had a panic attack and had to go back onto stand. That's fine. We don't ever want to take a passenger um, uh, who doesn't want to go, but the knock-on effect is that if they have bags in the hold due to security, we won't be able to fly with those bags in the hold, so that the bags will have to be offloaded and that passenger will have to be returned to the airport. The team will have to meet that passenger and take them back, so we can um, uh, shake the pan a little bit and cause a, a degree of work for um, the ground staff at, at the station. It's 1am at Stansted Airport, where the airline's biggest cargo plane is landing. Yep, this is it. It's coming in. The companies decided to risk sending their donated flight directly to Cebu. They're keen it doesn't go unnoticed. Mary Barry, the airline's charities officer, is here to oversee its departure. You look like that. I'm very excited, actually. I've <laughs> been sort of worried that we weren't going to get it into Cebu. It's really good to know that it's, we're getting as close to the disaster region as we can make it, really, which is fantastic. It's like a spaceship. The airline's sending their cargo expert, Steve Rook, to make sure the aircraft is turned around as quickly as possible. As the aid gathers momentum, there's a lot of freight and a lot of cargo going into Cebu. So it has been quite congested. I'll be there on the ground, hopefully, to get this aircraft serviced as quickly as possible so it can return to its normal schedule. Knocking heads together? Not so much knocking heads together, but using a calm approach and explaining to people what exactly what is required. Mainly sanitary equipment, toilets, latrines, uh, and such like. There's also been a very kind donation by the Queen of Spain of med medical supplies. The Queen has requested a photograph of her shipment being loaded on the aircraft. What's your photography like? Poor, that's why I've got a professional doing it for me. <laughs> and uh, I believe the Queen also wants a photograph of the offload in Cebu. It's really sort of a special moment, isn't it, really? You know, it really is. a lot of hard work that's sort of gone into pulling all this together and then just to sort of see it coming together is just really fantastic. 
what we're sending out, the basics of life, and not to have them must be absolutely horrendous. So I truly believe this makes a difference. I'm really, really do. 120 tons of emergency aid is on its way to the Philippines. 12 hours after the plane lands there, it's scheduled to be back in the system on a commercial cargo flight from Hong Kong. I'm very fortunate that I live in a comfortable environment, but you know, you only need to look at the news that the, around the world there are people who are far worse off than us, and if they think that I can come into work and do something that will help those people and make their situation better, that's very important, very fulfilling. After a quick turnaround in Geneva, Joel has flown the return leg of his maiden voyage and is about to land back at Heathrow. How was that? Oh, it was amazing. Did you land there? Yes, yeah, that, was, that was my landing. Good landing? Sorry? Good landing? Yeah, it was, it was lovely, actually. It went a little bit high towards the end, but it, it recovered nicely, so very happy. Thank you. Quite an intense experience, so recalling the whole thing is uh, probably going to be quite difficult, but uh, I think I'll remember the, the feeling rather than the actual experience itself. Sort of like a wedding day. Exactly, yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Andy is also landing at the end of his first flight. He's flown both legs of the trip to Pisa. I think I still need to finesse my landing technique. Hopefully I can get them a bit smoother. It finally does feel real. It's nice. It, sort of being in control of, of a big aircraft, is, it does sort of empower you as such. And it, it's, it's a really nice feeling. Joel and Andy are the first cadet pilots trained by the airline to land at Heathrow for over a decade. It's hard to express, actually, I think, how tiring it is doing, doing what he's doing. Um, today, coming in here for, for his first day commercially, there's an awful lot going on. He's learning at a great rate, actually, which is, which is the aim of the game. After flying this sector, we're now off to jump on a different aircraft to fly off to Pisa for the night, uh, to, sorry, Helsinki for the night. And he is now part of BA. What do we do in the next sector? Um, be honest, I'm getting quite tired now. OK, all right, well, let's not do that then. Yeah. Um, one of 40,000 employees in a very British airline. Until you move around the airline and, and, and meet the various different people, you don't necessarily comprehend how much it takes everyone to deliver their little bit to make the whole picture work. People do feel like they belong to BA and they are part of BA and that's why people will stay, um, stay working for BA. Yeah. 